This is Rostra, the St. Theodore Guerin Junior Classical League podcast, where we bring the lessons of classical study into the light for the benefit of all. Welcome back to another episode of Rostra. We're really fortunate today. We've got uh, Dominic Morangello and I got to say, Dominic, I'm so glad to have you on roster because I know your mind. I know how you think about uh, so many different things. And so I'm really curious uh, to see what you have about this topic. And uh, let's start off with what, what is your topic? So my topic is the uh, Greek and Persian Wars. Greek and Persian Wars. Okay, so um, think of your greatest college rivalry in, in football, right, or basketball, right. Um, and then ramp that up considerably, and you got the Greco-Persian Wars. Uh, so, so talk to, first of all, why, why are you interested in that? Well, I think there's a couple reasons why, but I think one of the most interesting for me, at least, is uh, it represents the fundamental shift from, of power from the Middle East, because if you really think about it, uh, for most of the world's history, power has been concentrated in Babylon, yeah. Uh, Kingdom of Jerusalem, all that power has been concentrated in the world, in the Middle East. And we see that shift almost to the West with the Greco-Persian Wars. Interesting perspective on that, which I think that, I think that is right on. And I don't know that, um, yeah, I don't know that I really hear that a whole lot in, in modern commentary about power in the world today. Um, recognizing the fact that, first of all, as you said, you've got kind of an original concentration of power in the Middle East, and then you see it shifting toward the West um, with, with the wars with Greece. So, okay, uh, let's get into the blood and guts of it, if we, if yeah. we will. Uh, what are we talking about? When are we talking about? What's this all about? That's a good question. So it's around, uh, it, it almost begins with a, a misunderstanding. As uh, so many wars do, right? <laughs> so, um... When Persia and Athens first made contact, uh, they sent an emissary out, and then the Persians asked for tribute of earth and water. And the Athenians just gave it to them, not thinking much of it. But to the Persians, it was a sign of subjugation. So in the Persians' mind, the Athenians were subjugated, and in the Athenians' mind, they were just good friends. So that rivalry started to boil over when um, there were some Greek city-states on the on the west side of Greece. And uh, what happened was uh, there were an open rebellion against the Persians or the satraps and the regional governor. And uh, Athens sided with uh, the Greeks, obviously on that side, they sent half their fleet over. And Zer uh, Darius was shocked. He was wondering why his whole vassalage in that area was just completely amiss. And the Athenians, and we went to talk to them, he said, well, you guys are tribute, you're my tributaries. And they were shocked. They didn't even know this at all. So it really just started with that huge misunderstanding. Boy, there's a lot I can say about, about that. Um, you, you, you've triggered a couple of actually personal thoughts um, with that. So, okay, so you, you, you've got that misunderstanding. And then how long does this if you will, misunderstanding boiling over into armed conflict. How long does this go on? Yeah, um, so the really interesting thing about this is originally the misunderstanding, uh, Darius wasn't prepared to invade all of Greece just because of minor, a misunderstanding. That takes a lot of resources and effort. No. So what really broke the camel's back was that rebellion. So as Greece, they say called Salmos in about, I think 500 BC around that area, uh, revolted. And um, what happened was, the Athenians sent half their fleet over. That whole misunderstanding happened. But Darius, Darius was really only angry that the Greeks actively helped a rebellion inside of his territory. And the conflict was about 30, 40 years long, uh, two generations almost. And even still after, there was still some, uh, with Alexander the Great, obviously, there was mm -hmm. still some conflict between those two parties. Um, another major uh, part of the conflict was the Greeks took a city-state called uh, Byzantium, mm -hmm. which was the key to uh, the Black Sea, that mm -hmm. whole trading network. And uh, the Phoenicians were tributaries of the Persians at the time. And they, they had their glory days. They were on the decline. But they were still the tributaries of Persia. And Persia no, no, no longer got a lot of resources from Russia because of this Greek intervention in their trade. Uh -huh. And that was starting to become a huge problem, especially because Ukraine produces so much food for them. 
Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, you referenced the name Alexander the Great, and that's kind of where I wanted to go next. With so many aspects of history, uh, and especially with aspects of, of military history, it's personalities, it's names that we associate um, with, with things. So who are some of the big personalities, maybe on, on both sides, uh, throughout the, the con various conflicts? Um, and and at, we've got to understand, there were, there were over this time, it wasn't just one steady stream of conflict, but there were, there were multiple conflicts uh, between Greek city-states and Persia. So, yeah, who are some of those big personalities on either side? Well, I mean, obviously, from the movie 300, we get Leonidas, huge personality. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's on which side? Uh, the Greek side. He's on the Greek side, right, King um, of Sparta. And we also have uh, Pausanias, who's another Spartan general, mm -hmm. who's very influential, mm -hmm. as well as Themistocles, a uh, yep. Persian ad uh, Greek admiral, yes. who commanded uh, the Greek army during their famous defeat, defeat of the Persians at the Battle of Salamis. Yeah. Um, and on the Persian side, they had a variety of commanders, yep. um, but it was mostly concentrated with their uh, king of kings. Whoever was the king of kings. Which was uh, between a two, it was two generational war, so we had Darius and we had Xerxes. Darius and Xerxes, yeah, yeah. Um, so at, at the end of the day, so we could get to the, maybe the end of the, all this, um, who comes out on top? Well, I think that most people would agree that the Greeks come up on top in pretty much all the conflicts. Mm -hmm. There's three main conflicts. Mm -hmm. There's that first one with uh, Darius, then his son Xerxes, who tries to get revenge, and Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. Those are the three main ones in my eyes. And the Greeks come up on top all the time in these conflicts. So the question I think everybody asks is why? Because if you look at just numerically, the Persians have it. The Persians should have this in the bag. Right, they, they field more soldiers, more warriors, um, every time. And yet, time and again, it's these little Greek city-states that, that on the one hand can't seem to get themselves together to be any kind of a unified nation, uh, but yet when they go to war, they seem to be successful against much greater odds. So, I just care, any personal opinion about that, why, why that would be? I've got a couple of personal opinions. Yeah. Um, I think probably... Obviously, there's the home turf advantage. That's always a big portion in it, factor in any war. But I think the significant, significant aspect, the most significant, is um, the Greeks fought in more organized formations mm. than I think the Persians did. Uh, sure, the Persians had their immortals, and those were getting to that level of classically organized troops. Yeah, yeah. But with Persia, they they almost were like, used feudal levies. Yes, and yes. And that's effective if you want, need a ton, a ton of people. But they just weren't, they weren't organized. Yeah. And they couldn't strike as deeply as Greeks could. And I think it, along with that, you've got issues of loyalty and, again, the reason why we're doing this. Great king commands that we've got to go do it. I don't know that I've got any personal stake in this, but I really have no choice because great king says we've got to go. Whereas other people, we're fighting for our homes. Right. right. This, these are my brothers, my cousins, my friends, and we're fighting to protect our homes. And so I think you've always got that incentive when 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 you're fighting uh, on the defensive side there. So, um, so many good things you mentioned. You know, obviously the the movie Three Hundred. Uh, that actual story has been done into a movie twice. Uh, back in the 1960s, there was the Three Hundred Spartans, and then in the 2000s, the movie Three Hundred. Uh, there's been at least two uh, English-speaking movies about Alexander the Great. Um, so obviously, these the stories that come out of these the, the Greek and Persian wars um, are, are good stories. People people enjoy the the historical stories and and, and you know grounded in reality. There, um, any particular things that you want to make sure that people listening to this episode hear or know about that really struck you as as interesting, fascinating. Just, man, I didn't know that, but I want to make sure people, other people do. Something that just, uh, I wrote my history IA, IA on the Battle of Salismus. Okay, uh, when you say IA, because some people listening to this may not know what you're talking about, uh, that is... Internal assessment in, for in, uh, IB. Internal assessment for the International Baccalaureate Program. Okay, so you wrote your IA on what? The Battle of Salismus. The Battle of Salamis, okay. And the interesting thing about that was, what really struck me was how... 
clever Greeks are or how they cl- clever they can be. They study, unlike their unlike Persians and a lot of people in that time, they study their military adversaries very well. Mm. For example, Themistocles, the main general in that, knew that Persians always trusted turncoats for some reason. Mm-hmm. So he poses that turncoat, and that's how he won the Battle of uh, the, the Salamis, Yeah, because he was able to trick the Persians into thinking that he was a turncoat. You know, if if Themistocles had been a Division I NCAA coach, he would definitely be the kind of guy who watched game footage of the opposing team before he went to play them. Yes. Right? He would have been that guy. He would have been watching the game footage and understanding how they move because, and, and that was brilliant, right? That was that's obviously a, a huge thing there. So, uh, well, Dominic, that is uh, absolutely fantastic. Good stuff there. We appreciate uh, having you on the show, and I think this is going to be a good episode. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Rostra. You may check out all our episodes on Spotify and follow us on social media at Garen JCL. That's at G-U-E-R-I-N-J-C-L.